I don't know if you, I just wanted to say a quick word of what Bobby said. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. I was reminded of that when he was <clears throat> speaking. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32, it says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit is better than he who captures a city. Imagine capturing a city. I mean, back in the olden days, imagine if somebody just captured a city. We tend to think of that as being so important. We tend to think of people who make jump pole vaults, as we heard, and all of that as being really special. <clears throat> he who, the Bible says he who is able to control his spirit is much more valuable. Our definition of success must be guided by the Bible, not by the world. So something similar I wanted to build on that as I spoke today. Um, what comes to your mind when you think of the state of your relationship with God? What comes to your mind when, you, when we think about the state of NCCF? Is God pleased and approving of me? Is God pleased and approving of NCCF? How do we know whether we are pleasing and approving to God individually as a, and as a church? I wanted to read this verse that came to my heart in this connection, Malachi chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. As the days grow nearer to the Lord's coming, I believe books like Zechariah and Malachi should be books we read often. We should be reminded of often because this was, these were the last prophets before Jesus came for the first time. These were the last words that God was saying to his people before Jesus came. And so as Jesus returns again a second time and his coming is near, these books must become very familiar with us. The spiritual significance of it, not the earthly, spirit, the earthly significance of it. <clears throat> Malachi chapter 1 verse 10. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might, you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. So here you got people who are offering sacrifices to God, who are laboring for God, and God is saying, I'm not pleased with you. I hope you will just shut the whole thing down. And he says in verse 11, for from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, I'm not just planning to shut things down because <clears throat> I'm never happy. From this rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, light incense is going to be offered in my name, to my name, and a grain offering that is pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. And so that's the burden that is on my heart today is that we will have, dear brothers and sisters, a laser focus on being pure, on being a pure church. As the good times increase, as we, incre as we experience blessings in our private lives or as a church, as we have times of fun and, and enjoyment in our personal lives and even on our church, we can be distracted from our calling as a church to be pure. Not that all of us get along, but that we be pure. Purity does mean that we will all get along, but purity is a lot more than just getting along. Purity must be the top of my focus and passion in my private life. Purity must be the, at the top of our focus and passion as a church. Purity in my actions, purity in my thoughts, Purity in my speech, purity in my conversations, purity in the way I play music, purity in the way I speak out here, purity in my interactions, everything, purity. Let me just think back to yesterday. We spent most of the day together. Let me ask myself about every action that I took together with all, all of you. Did I speak like Jesus in every word that I said to all of you? Did I look at others of the opposite sex in the way you would look? 
We had men and women going down a slip and slide. Did I look at the opposite sex the way Jesus would? Did I see bad behavior in some children and judge them in a way Jesus wouldn't have? Condemning them, condemning their parents. Was I pure like Jesus was pure? Purity, family, if we don't laser focus, as we drove back last night, did we think about the wonderful time we had? I hope we did. I hope we thank God and we were grateful. But would we also ask ourselves, was I pure, Lord Jesus, as you were pure? In my speech, in my thoughts, in my actions, where, Lord Jesus, did I miss out on purity? Now, this is not a negative thing. This is making the most important things the most important things. And this is a constant focus that we must have or we will lose our way into becoming a community into becoming a club and not being the pure church of Jesus Christ. I want to talk about the devil's deception. We talk, we talk a lot about the devil. I talked last week, last time I spoke about the devil's deception. The devil's deception for purity is quantity. You know that the devil offered, when he talked to Jesus, his final offering to the devil, Jesus was this. He offered all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And the glory of the world in many different ways is quantity. What is the size of my army? What is the size of my nuclear weapons if I'm a kingdom? What is the size of my bank account? What is the title after my name? What is the size of my church? What is the size of my Twitter followers? How many likes? Things like that. Quantity is so important to this world. And when the kingdom of this world and its glory is being offered, quantity is such a big deal. What was your revenue last year? How much did your stock portfolio grow last year? That's the way the world thinks. Quantity is the way the world thinks. Purity is the way the church thinks. And I find that as numbers increase, and we were seven years ago, maybe 15, 20 people. We're not some big, massive church. You know that. But as numbers increase, we can be led astray from focusing on purity. It happens. We can become sloppy in the way we talk. We can become sloppy in the way we dress. We can become sloppy in the way we interact with one another. Casual in the way we play music, casual in the way we speak in our pulpit. I was talking, you know, I had an interesting um, event happen this week. I was in an offsite with my co workers from work, and the point was to bond with one another as, as co workers because we can then work better as a team. So I had that during the week, and then I come and I have a bonding experience with the church <laughs> yesterday, all day. So it was an interesting. Parallel and comparison. And, and they were telling me something interesting. They said that once an organization gets to a certain size, and they are not some experts in organization or anything, but they were just saying from their own experience that once organizations get to a certain size, things of sloppiness just need to just start to happen. And they were talking specifically about office affairs. They said, once it gets to a certain size, you can start hiding. People can start doing things and hiding and people get lost. And office affairs just start to happen. Just based on the numbers and percentages. As people become more and more familiar with other people, guards are let down. Things can be hidden more in secret. Texting here and there. Private conversations here and there, all in the name of work. Same things can happen in our church as we become more and more familiar with one another. What is it going to be said about NCCF as we grow? <clears throat> I haven't heard of anything, so I'm not addressing any issue. I'm speaking to the deceiver. Family, the deceiver comes in subtle ways. And he's going to try to trick us. And the only way we are going to be protected is if we keep our laser focus on personal purity and church purity. May it not be said that we were flirtatious in the way we spoke. Definitely not more five years 
compared to five years ago. May it not be said that we are more crude or personal attacks in the way we spoke towards other people. May it not be said, family of God, that we were no different from the world in the way we spoke. <clears throat> Let me give you one instance about this. I'm not here to criticize anybody. I've noticed that in the church, there's a lot lately, even among brothers and sisters, about talk about diet and healthy living. I don't have any, I'm not anti against any of that stuff. Please hear me right. But that's what the world is talking about. And I fear that we can get so caught up with carbs are bad and sugars are bad. Trust me, sugars are bad. I believe that with all of my heart. <laughs> But we can get so obsessed and family, the Dalil, the, the devil is a deceiver. <clears throat> and all in the name of good health, all in the name of good health, we can lose our laser focus towards purity. Purity of our soul, purity of our spirit. We're talking about good things. <clears throat> We're talking about eating more fruits and vegetables. But that's what all dominates our thoughts. You ask yourself, dear brother, dear sister, what are you thinking about all week? What did Jesus think about all week? Was he worried about his, how much muscles his were, how big his muscles were? If he was a woman, what was he concerned about? Oh, I gained five pounds this week. My goodness, tragedy has hit. Ten pounds. What's wrong with this world? My walls come crashing down. Because the weighing machine, the mirror, dominates my life. Purity, family of God, purity. The world can creep in in subtle ways. And we must fight. I'm not against it. You know me. You know me as I've talked among you. I talk about many, many different subjects. But I want us all to guard what is the main thing in our lives. What dominates our thoughts. For some of us, it's career. So for some, of us, it's, for some of us, it's retirement. I'm not obsessing just on diet or other things. For some of us, men, it may be our financial bank balance. It could be many different things. What does Jesus say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Very clear. Not the size of my waist, not the size of my bank balance, not the size of my retirement plan. And as quantity increases in our church too, there will be the, the spirit in, of the world will come in, where there will be Jesus and money, Jesus and a good time, Jesus and worldly fashions, Jesus and a fit body. And it will slowly creep to have parallel thrones. Jesus only is our message. And family of God, we've got to fight it. We've got to fight it. I'm not speaking at anybody. I'm talking about myself. Because I see about how it can easily come into my own life. And I'm not saying that new people will come in and corrupt us. More often than not, it's the existing members it's the ones who have been around for a while, who've been Christians for a while, who can talk a good game. It's from there, from the leaders, from those who have positions of authority, from there will slip in a little bit of the world. And it will make it okay for you guys too to follow. Because people who speak well, who do well, who have given some position of authority, used to be sold out for the Lord and now start to okay it. I'm not saying it's true in our church. Please, I hope it's not true. But I have to guard myself. And we all have to guard ourselves to make sure that Jesus is getting a pure offering from my life. Not a big quantity of offering. And I have to ask myself as I, I come back from having a wonderful time as a church together last night. The question that the Lord is asking me, not did you have a good time. Were there big fights? You know there were no big fights. We all left in great time. Great time of singing and praising God. But the Lord's asking me, was it a pure church? You used to be a pure church. Are you still a pure church? And watch it, Sandeep, as the church grows bigger, purity will get compromised. And I'm not speaking at anybody. 
There's a verse in Psalm chapter 29, verse 2, which says, Ascribe to the Lord glory to his name, worship the Lord in, in the dress of holiness. In the beauty of holiness, the King James Bible says, Psalm chapter 29, verse 2. Family of God, if you say you worship God, this is what it means. That you genuinely see, have seen the beauty of holiness. This is the mark that we are worshippers. That we are not looking at the mirror and seeing beauty. We are not looking at our bank balance and seeing beauty. We are looking at the holiness of God and seeing beauty. And God knows what a deep work has to be done in all of us. Let me ask myself a deep question. Do I worship God because His holiness is so beautiful to me? If not, I have work to do. That is the way we need to worship God. Worship is not about music. Worship is not about feeling good. Worship is about seeing the holiness of God and saying, that's beautiful. Seeing when I see a beautiful woman and turning away and saying, that's beautiful. When I turn away from an act of loving money, I turn away and I hear the Lord telling me, that's beautiful. And my taste buds are changing to more of the beauty of God, the beauty of His holiness, family that, that needs to happen in our lives. And the other verse, word in, in Malachi chapter 1 verse 11, three times in that verse he says, my name must be great. He talks about my name, my name, three times in that verse. And I find that purity has a connection to the name of Jesus. And this is what I practically mean about the name of Jesus. Am I interested in God's name or my name? Am I interested in God looking good or Sandeep looking good? In the way I speak, do I want to win the argument? Do I want to be the winner? Do I want to have the last word in marriage relationships and conversations with others? In the way I act, do I want to look good? Do I want to come across as better than others? Children, I want to, I want to tell you something beautiful that happened yesterday. I'm not going to tell you who. There, were two, there was a game we were playing yesterday. All of us were playing that. It was called Capture the Parachute. I don't want to say capture the bacon because some people may have problems eating pork, so I'll stay away from that. <laughs> capture the parachute. We were anyway capturing parachutes. And we had adults and children on two sides, and the children were matched up with somebody around their same age, and the adults were matched up according to people of their own athletic ability, of course, so supposedly, <laughs> but the children. And the children also had to go and capture the flag and see if they could get back to the other side without getting tagged. And something beautiful that happened, I saw two of the children were running up against each other, and one time one child won, and the other time the other child won. It happens all the time, right? Thankfully, that, that happened. So there was a split, 1-1. But here's the beautiful thing. Both times, the girl, one girl, went up to the other person and both times and said, good job, to the other person when she won and when she didn't win. And there was no difference in the way she said good job. One wasn't an act of pity, <laughs> benevolent. <laughs> oh, I feel so sorry for you, but good job. <laughs> you get ribbon for trying, participation medal. No, it was an equal, innocent, good job, happiness. Both times. And she meant it. It was not about winning. She cared about the person more than about winning. I've seen in myself that there's a very dangerous thing about winning that is in the kingdom of this world. It comes through, we play in sports, and there's a dangerous, sinful spirit that comes in as you've got two sides trying to win. Because the question is, 
whose name and I make it about my name or his name my name or her name and we never win that right battle we have to family as a church make it about God's name this is what is special about the church we are laser focused on honoring God and his name that is purity Purity is not just the absence of evil. Purity is the presence of the life of Jesus. We're not going to get purity by going and closeting up ourselves and saying, I'm never going to compete with anybody else again. I'm not going to have any fun. I'm just going to be a monastic person. That's not purity. That's just keeping yourself clean because you're so afraid. There's nothing virtuous of a clean, empty cup to a thirsty man. <laughs> Here you go, clean cup for you. I cleaned it out, perfect for you. But it's empty. What the thirsty person needs is water in a clean cup. The life of Jesus. The life of Jesus, which is love. A lack of spirit of competition towards others must come up. And we're all works in progress. We must share that. Family, I want to read some things and I want you to know if you recognize this blessed assurance Jesus is mine perfect submission all is at rest I in my Savior am happy and blessed oh this full and perfect peace in a love which cannot cease I am his and he is mine Oh, to lie, live, oh, to lie forever here while he whispers in my ear, I am his and he is mine. His forever, only his, who the Lord and me shall part. Do you know, do you recognize those words? You sang it 10 minutes ago. We sang it 10 minutes ago. The focus of the singing, the focus of this church is about... If Jesus and you are all you have, that's way more than enough. All you need is Jesus. Jesus only is our message. We don't want to lose sight of that family. That will take us through tribulations. That will take us through good times and bad times. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Family of God, I pray that purity in our church will increase. May the test that our church is growing is not that we're growing in numbers, that all of us will be laser focused on guard in making sure that this church is pure. May God help us.